welcome everyone to uh, the panel on data and justice. Uh, we have three speakers who ha each have, uh, you know, different takes and different new courses. This is an area that seems to be like there's a lot of innovation and there's a lot of uh, creating new curriculum and people feeling their way into the space with different takes on it. Uh, I think it's really exciting time. Uh, I think it's really exciting that, you know, people are people are leaning into the idea and trying to feel out what it's like to, you know, make a practical experience for their students to explore things. Um, and uh, certainly, certainly it's 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 a. Uh, Given the events of the past year, it's like a it's a fertile time for our society to be exploring how we teach. Um, I um, want to start out with Anna Lauren Huffman, who's a professor at University of Washington, who has done uh, all sorts of things, uh, but teaching ethics and teaching a data justice class. And um, I think she's going to start us off by talking about um, her implementation. Yeah, yeah, happy, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, and uh, also want to send uh, my love to the East Bay. I have my mama's Royal Cafe mug, and because uh, I actually first taught on, on topics of data and justice specifically uh, at Berkeley uh, when I was at the School of Information briefly. And now I'm an assistant professor at the University of Washington, and uh, I have been I've been teaching and writing and researching on topics related to sort of data information technology and justice broadly for I guess about 10, 12 years now, and uh, across multiple institutions, and and uh, you've gotten to do this and think about this through the various sort of uh instantiations that I, that that the the topic has taken on over time whether it was you know whether we were in then it was big data ethics and then it was data ethics and now we're talking ai ethics machine learning ethics getting more sort of in some ways specific in our in our uh, conversations but also kind of just reflecting the the trends of what's on people's minds and and and, and what um and what institutions are investing in and, and what skills uh, students are, are interested in acquiring. And one thing that I find really interesting is there is this kind of sense of urgency over you know the last handful of years. Uh, and, and as you note, Eric, especially in light of the events of 2020, both the pandemic, the, the uprisings and, um, and, and, and uh, rebellions of the past uh, year and a half, and um, that that urgency is warranted, but one one thing that I have learned in in my research um, is that the engaging these questions uh, are not new. And there's this sense that we we almost I find that other educators uh, can at times we let ourselves off the hook a little bit, like. This is new. We're learning. We're learning how to do this. People aren't talking about this, and and you know so and, and we should give our give ourselves you know grace when we're acquiring new knowledge and, and new languages and, and new skills. But but at the same time, it, the the earliest you know sort of manifestations um, uh, of conversations of say ethics in the context of engineering involved questions of social progress, and of course yeah. Uh, yeah, so some context for this. Uh, I, as part of an NSF grant uh, that recently concluded, um, a, a team of us, including folks at Berkeley and Cornell and Washington, were looking at sort of how do we learn from sort of that or the longer history of engineering and computer ethics education for data science education. So we're not for data ethics education. So we're not constantly sort of, we I always feel like we're reinventing the wheel uh, if you've spent any time in this space. And so uh, we, we, you know, we dug back and, and, and part of this we did, we released a report that was kind of synthesizing some insights across literature. We looked at 300 plus some articles in, you know, in depth, summarized themes. And um, uh, and I have to give credit to uh, my my student and, and research assistant, uh, Catherine Cross, who, who was instrumental in this work with me. And 
you know, we found instances of these conversations in the 1920s and people were talking about sort of engineering and ethics in this way that it was very, it was very oriented towards what we can, would consider justice topics, topics of, of social welfare, of, of distribution of resources, uh, you know, of course, in the 1920s, it had this very eugenicist social progress tinge, and it's not a model we're going to emulate. But the idea here is that these these questions and these topics have always been interwoven. And I would encourage folks to kind of disavow themselves of the newness, not the urgency, but the newness, and that there are lessons and insights that we can, we can pull historically. Uh, and so one of the things that I have tried to do as my approach to these topics has evolved over time is to uh, is to situate students. I uh, is to situate students in the middle of, of debates. Uh, I, I don't really like using I don't really like using sort of war war uh, metaphors or analogies. But there's this scene from the 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 series the miniseries Band of Brothers, right, which is about a, a team of paratroopers. And there's a, there's this, this moment where uh, where uh, some soldiers are about to leave, the, the paratroopers are about to leave, and somebody says, uh, it, it, it looks like you're going to be surrounded out there. And, and, and the person says, well, we're paratroopers, we're supposed to be surrounded. And I feel like, I feel like that's, my, that's, that's how I often orient my students towards these issues that you're going to drop into, you're going to start engaging questions of, 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 of social well-being, of of sort of collective responsibility of, of justice uh, and, and along axes of, of race and gender and class and ability, you're going to feel surrounded, and you're supposed to be surrounded. You live in the world, and and I think that's the that's the orientation I try to bring to it. Is I situate students inside debates um, rather than you know what I might consider like an information ethics 1.0 approach, where we're kind of like extrapolating ethical theories or theories of justice. I've spent and, and you know. All you know, all due respect in, in, in that venue. I, I've spent a ton of time myself um, in my own research and writing, sort of grappling with with um, directly with theories of justice. But I, I often feel for students, you know, they need a compass. They need a sense of the kinds of debates and the kinds of questions that are that are coming at them. So rather than giving them some theory of justice and then we're going to move forward and examine, say, facial recognition technology with using that theory, instead I say, you know. Let's look at, for example, sort of rights-based approaches to the question of uh, facial recognition technology that emphasize autonomy and privacy. And then let's focus on, and then let's juxtapose those with say abolitionist approaches that are talking about these technologies in the context of securitized borders and, and law enforcement surveillance and talking about bans. And talking about um, and, and talking about explicit non uses of certain kinds of technology, right? And so, how can we? Uh, so, how can I then situate students so that when they hear these things, both from their colleagues, from the from the news, from uh, from critics, right? They have some sense of of the 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 kinds of um, conversations that they are surround be, they're surrounded by uh, when they're doing their work. Um, and so I'll, I'll just leave it as that is kind of like an opening provocation. I, I have other thoughts, but I want this to be a, a conversation. So that's just a little bit about my approach and my uh, um, and, and, and where I'm coming from on, on this topic. Great. Thank you, Anna. Um, Jerry, can we hear from you next? Jerry Volsey, professor at Spelman College, uh, has been uh, attended this workshop a couple times and um, helping spearhead this uh, you know new class for the AUC um, data in the African diaspora and taught that for the first time this year. Yes, thank you, Eric and Anna. Um, uh, I really appreciate it, uh, a lot of what you've said there because a lot of that resonates uh, with some of our approaches and some of the things that we're trying to do. Um, I don't have quite the depth of experience that you have in, the, in this topic, but you, you've said some of the things I wanted to say here perhaps better than, than, than I'm able to say them. So just from by way of introduction, um, I am the Deputy Director of the Data Science Initiative at the Atlanta University Consortium. Uh, for those who may not be familiar, it's a consortium of four schools, Morehouse, Spelman, Clark, and the Morehouse School of Medicine. Um, it's an it's a, it's a interesting mix because two of them are liberal arts schools. They're all small institutions. Spelman is an all-women's liberal arts school. Morehouse is an all-men's liberal arts school. Clark Atlanta is a 
um, our two institution, it's got a graduate program and an undergraduate program, Morehouse and Spelman are just undergraduate. And Morehouse School of Medicine is a graduate medical school. So it's a, it's a, you, get, you get the mix of, of, of all the um, uh, uh, microverse there. Um, none of them have a data science program. All of them understand the importance of data science and recognize that um, African Americans, these are four HBCUs, are just not well represented in that space. And so the desire has been, you know, we need to stand up a data science program. Well, of course, the resources to do that at four institutions are best spent in the collective. And that's where the consortium comes into play. So the data science initiative is a consortium level initiative to really raise the data literacy of the entire uh, uh, AU Center. I mean, all the schools involved therein. We started this oh, three years ago at some uh, by now and have just sort of um, really looked at the literature to see what other people are doing. We've traveled the country and we've, we've talked to different people who have started programs, people who are sort of uh, uh, where we were just at the ground level. And with, um, Berkeley was one of those schools and has really been uh, influential in, in uh, terms of what we've actually done. And one of the things that um, became obvious to us early on is that um, in order to stand up a major, we probably have to stand up a minor first, but before that, we really need to address some of the issues that are um, really barriers in terms of getting students um, interested in data science, particularly the students that we serve, the African-American community. In our travels around the countries and in speaking to different institutions, uh, we have the benefit of not being the first to do this. There are a couple of things that, a couple of themes that came up um, uh, for us. Number one was what I mentioned before is that there is an imbalance in terms of representation, there's a lack of representation for African Americans. And number two, almost to an institution, um, we were told that issues having to do with bias, ethics, fairness, validity, all those things, if, if we had to do the program over, these are things that we would put in the foundation of the program and not an afterthought. Almost to an institution, that's the message we receive. So in formulating our own program, this is a message that we took very seriously. And in trying to do the two things of making sure that we incorporate these issues on the, at the foundation and figuring out how are we going to entice African-American students into the field of data science, we thought about couching it into something that students can resonate with. And the Atlanta University Center, of course, has a rich history in social justice, civil rights, and things along that line. And from those is born this class, data and the African, the, uh, diaspora, African American diaspora. This is a class that I call a data awareness class. And to differentiate from a data science class, uh, because its intent is a little bit different from what you would typically find as an introductory data science class. Its intent is to draw in students and make data science relevant for the community that it serves. That means that it's a course that we intend for every student to be able to take no matter what major and really no matter what year. That means that, so this is a challenge, we've got to find a course that can cater to the students who, you know, we, we have two liberal arts schools and many of those students select their majors because they don't want to do math, right? And so we've got to figure out how to make this course approachable, how to make it accessible and how to make it relevant so that a student takes that course and, and understands the social implications, the individual implications, the national implications of data. How is it that issues of ethics and bias and fairness and justice emerge from data? Um, it's, it's a surprisingly, um, it's a topic that is surprisingly, for many students, they're unaware of it. And so that's what this class is intended um, to bring out. We piloted the class in, uh, this, this past spring, we put it together in the fall, you know, fairly quickly, actually, uh, and, and we piloted it in the spring. So that's, that's sort of what we're up to, uh, some of the details about some of the things we do in the class, so we'll talk about here as the conversation uh, pro progresses. 
but that's sort of the introduction of where, where things are with us. Great, thanks, Jerry. Uh, we'll turn to Margo, who's our STS and uh, HCE leader within uh, data science and, and had the, the experience of uh, launching a new class at the lower division level that's both a lower division data science class and an American cultures class. Um, data for AC the, this semester. And, and Margo, you can tell us about that effort. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Eric. And before I begin, I want to say how actually much I've learned from both Anna and, uh, and Jerry in this last past semester. So for Anna's work has been really core to the development of this course, my own thinking about that long history, Anna, that you've mentioned of the uh, you know, the engineering ethics traditions, critical inquiry into technology and society of days ago and its relevance uh, for the present, how it can speak to students in the present. All your work on roles and in information societies have been closely read <laughs> and genuinely um, appreciate you being a part, thought partner in this, in this journey, even if we hadn't met previously. So specifically really grateful for you being here with us today. And Jerry, uh, again, also, this is the first encounter, uh, virtual first encounter, but we exchanged a series of emails at the very Thank beginning you. of our spring semesters when both of us were starting these brand new courses, both in this orbit of data and justice and trying to bring these two things together in very different institutional contexts and yet with some very overlapping purposes. And even though we, because of the busyness of the semester, weren't able to sync up in a real way until now, I felt you as a partner uh, along in the journey uh, throughout. And so I appreciate this moment to, to think together and about, about this, these courses and, and what they stand for and, um, and the, the kind of the, the movement and approaches that they describe. So forgive me for a more formulaic uh, presentation but I had prepared some slides to explain in more depth about what the Berkeley course that I co-taught that I co-taught this semester with uh, professor colleague dear colleague and uh, lecturer Ari Edmondson um, and a graduate student a wonderful graduate student instructor Janet Torres uh, I want to share with you a little bit more about what this course was about as a way to explain our approach uh, so the course engages students with fundamental questions of justice in relation to data and computing in the context of American society. And it examines key sites of justice. Uh, I'll explain a little bit more what we mean by sites of justice. And it, along the way, provides students with critical social science tools at the same time as giving them, and I really like Jerry's term, uh, data awareness, ex experience with working with a little bit of data, um, a little bit of data kind of projects and analysis, and uh, experience of uh, using real world data to, to understand the power and the limitations of data. So I want to share with you um, first kind of the, that what's the real motivation for us individually with Ari and myself for Berkeley and the people who had this course in mind from the beginning of the data science major and of coming into being at Berkeley. What, and, and kind of responding, as Anna said, to the urgency of this moment. Why? Why this course and why now at Berkeley? So that some of this is, has already been said and it's um, obvious, obvious I, probably to everybody joining the panel, but just our current moment, right? Finding ourselves in the middle of uh, a world where we are doing everything virtually. Uh, and this is a giant experiment. Uh, we are all, we were, have all been thrust in a little over a year ago with COVID, the COVID pandemic. And having to negotiate these systems and realizing, I think not surprisingly, that these systems are revealing, exacerbating existing inequalities, the renewing uh, racial justice movements at the forefront of contemporary politics. Uh, we, we see how, right, it, how much, uh, how much COVID itself, even without the, 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 the presence of digitality in our lives, uh, affects people differently, uh, in, predictably, in predictable ways with the same oppressions that existed in the past. We see um, with within uh, January 6th insurrection at the White House, the, the role of information technologies in the perpetuation of that, uh, of, of making that possible and in its kind of 
formation, the, the ways in which those technologies and those forms of communication support and reinforce certain uh, I, I, supremacists, uh, white supremacist uh, ideologies and actions. At the same time as we have this deeply troubling moment that we're grappling with and thinking of what is the relationship between data and, and uh, these contemporary calls for justice and the injustices that we experience today. We have also the promise, the promises of data science and, and it, it, what it can do for society. The division of data science computing and society is, is built upon that promise um, in part. Students are hopeful that with new data technologies, uh, data collections, visualizations, analysis, we can, uh, they can perform, they can struggle for racial and social justice because of the way that the injustices can be made visible, imaginable, and actionable in new ways. Um, and there are promises that data and computing will deliver us to less biased systems, ones that can actually take care of the problems of the past, the structural inequities of the past. And yet at the same time, constant reminders of the ways in which uh, we have to grapple with those histories of the past independently of the technologies and together with them. <laughs> Uh, we have also this uh, very, you know, at the national level and here locally at Berkeley, we have a, uh, a, a series of very thoughtful, uh, very active uh, sites of resistance and critique of the promises um, of, of data and computing. For example, this is an this is an image of a of a tweet that shows the demonstration against um, at Berkeley on Sproul Hall uh, by students organizing against uh, the university's relationship with Palantir because of how Palantir was providing data data services to uh, ICE Immigration Customs Authority in the United States and. Um, even more recently, we had a, uh, a ser this semester, there was a session on anti-Blackness in technology at Berkeley, a listening session for faculty and administrators in, the, in Berkeley uh, electrical engineering and computer science departments um, and in Berkeley data science to hear about uh, from students, from Black students and other students of color to hear about their experience in data science and computing classrooms and the kinds of, pro uh, you know, the kind of data daily uh, oppressions that they face uh, as in, in relation to the ways the courses are taught and the content and how they are, what, what, what the content is that they are taught with. And lastly, in contrast to the moment, to the urgency of the moment, we also have this long history of uh, of data and its relationship to justice and, and injustice. So the history of uh, the rise of statistics, which are constitute the foundational tools of contemporary data analysis in, uh, in projects of eugenics. Uh, the concept of regression being defined uh, by Francis Galton uh, as a way in part to identify and differentiate people and, uh, and later turned into systems and mechanisms of actually uh, you know, policing and oppressing people um, in, uh, in the most profound, violent ways of that our world and nation has known in the last uh, century. At the same time, there is a history of resistance through data, uh, moments of resistance, novel adaptations of the same new tools of statistics, such as uh, this images from a, a beautiful uh, work by W. Du Bois illustrates from the 1900s, uh, using statistics to fight for injustices by promoting and disseminating alternative narratives to uh, the black experience. So we, I think we, we and we know here in this panel and in the audience gathered here, we know of all these pieces, but I just want to, putting them all on one slide really reveals to what extent confronting this relationship of data and justice is, is necessary and uh, essential a part of not just studying data science, but really being a citizen of the present world. And so uh, what our class was doing uh, in a, is responding. So, okay, so it was responding to this series of events and realities of the world. It was also responding to a very real uh, a need. It's very similar, I think, to what Jerry observed in at, at uh, the ASUCs. Um, 
around around the need to support students into the into beginning data data science into feeling like they belong in data science. Um, we have a core foundational course, Data 8 at Berkeley, which is an incredible new innovative course that already does so much of the work of making data science accessible to all. And uh, yet some students continually even struggle at that beginning moment. And so having a course that sits before Data 8 that can be a way to lead in an on-ramp to Data 8 that begins with the questions around justice that, as Jerry said, actually... Uh, end up being, and for many, for many data science students and computer science students, the thing that they want to do and they need to learn about anyways at the end, right? They're, they want to study data science, computer science in order to do social good, in order to, as they conceive it, in order to help improve the world. And so why not put that concept of justice at the beginning? Uh, and at the same time, through that concept of justice at the beginning, draw in the people for whom maybe data science doesn't matter at first, but for whom that question of justice is centrally what matters. And so uh, I, I think it's really wonderful how these courses can do this work of, of not just putting forward what is really there at the heart of data science and computing projects and beginning with that, but also through that move, genuinely serving students who begin in that world already, who might not see themselves as data science and computer sciences yet. And then through this experience of realizing that their projects of social justice and interest in uh, of qu questions of race and gender and class and American society connect to data, get interested and study data science going forward. Um, the third really important component to the making of our course the way that it is, is another element of Berkeley history uh, and its history kind of in the way that it manifests in the present in curricular ways. So this is uh, the story of the American Cultures Program at Berkeley, in which, which emerges in, a, in response to student protests in the 1980s against apartheid. And students at this time were asking the university to divest from South African companies. And at the same time as they were looking at the world and, and the kinds of oppression that was going on elsewhere, they were thinking about what could we do here on campus, on Berkeley campus, to uh, teach students in ways that such oppression might not happen again, or to at least understand the way that it happens and support students in, 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 in becoming better human being. And so they launched, um, they started asking questions about right, what can be done here at home at Berkeley. And they started a curriculum reform effort. And the American Cultures Program passed as uh, a, as the answer to this, this <clears throat> activity in the spring of 1989. The American Cultures is the only UC, sorry, not UC, Berkeley-wide campus requirement. And it in, it, it's, it has, um, actually, I don't know how many, but I imagine you know, um, hundreds of courses. Uh, maybe that scale is wrong, but many, many, many courses across, across curriculum departments that focus on how the diversity of Americans, uh, America's constituent cultural traditions have shaped and continue to shape American identity and experience. And so data for AC, AC stands for American cultures, it means that it, it is an American cultures course. And in being an American cultures course, it uh, puts the experience of data and justice by different American races, ethnicities, cultures at the foreground. It foregrounds those experiences. It invites students to consider ways in which groups' experiences are informed by their different positionings in an American society that's characterized by systemic racial oppression and in the context of racial stratification that has co-evolved with data technologies since the beginning of American society. And so students uh, have learned to, to think about the process of technology in the making of identity and in the governing of collective life in that very long-term tradition that uh, Anna was pointing to. So I have, um, I have many more slides. Maybe what I will do is I will finish with this presentation of the learning outcomes that we're aiming at, which kind of completes one picture of the course. And I'll hold off on sharing more details about the course and happy to share slides with everybody um, 
after after the after the panel if you would like to learn more about the details of the course but or okay um a few things to say there are four core learning outcomes uh, that we hope students will come away with so one is we would we, we want to teach them about the, the co-production of justice with data in the United States, specifically in racial contexts. We want them to see how justice is a historically contingent category and how it's value laden, institutionally embedded, and that it's made together with data technologies through the long history of uh, conceptions of justice and specifically in, in American context. We want them to be able to identify fundamental constitutive role that race uh, of, of role in, ma uh, sorry, of race, the role of race in matters of data in American life and how data tools can embed and counteract racialized systems of power. We want them to be able to see through that long history the way that data science and technology have been used in the pursuit of justice at the same time as they've been tools for perpetuating injustice particularly in relation to American cultures. So that kind of co-production, co co-constitution of co technology and a core value and uh, orientation for, for collective life of justice. Um, the second piece is that we, we strive for them to recognize the mark of American histories in today's socio-technical systems. So we want them to see the historical import of American race relations and the history of, uh, the history of slavery and the formation of the quote-unquote new world up to the present Black Lives Matter movement, significance for uh, the kinds of data science tools that are used today. Um, and we want them to articulate the importance of American history for assessing the importance of justice in today's world. So a, a big portion of the course, especially the first portion is a historical presentation of the evolution of, of, of race formation in the United States with, uh, with data technologies. And then the subsequent, really, subsequent parts of the semester focus on sites of justice uh, where we also go deep into the history of those sites of justice. So it's, a lot of it is grounded in American history. Third, um, third core learning outcome for us is that we, through this process, we want students to come away and value and be able to use diverse forms of knowing. Of knowing. So learning to listen, re to recognize, respect ways of knowing and experiencing the world by people whose positionality is different from their own including voices and, uh, and epistemologies that are not usually represented in the academy. So this is a core tenant of anti-racist pedagogy and inclusive learning. And we're trying, to, we do, we're trying to activate this in the class by giving them literature to read, by uh, fiction literature, by having a poetry, uh, you know, trying to use as much poetry as we could in the course, at the same time as they were learning to speak the language of data, to analyze data, to work with data, to make data visualizations. So we wanted them to you know, value and, and recognize that pursuing projects of data and justice required these other recognizing and appreciating and genuinely valuing, valuing uh, as highly as valuing data epistemologies, valuing knowledges of diverse populations and the, in the ways that they express themselves. And, and uh, last piece was oriented at action and the capacity to reimagine and build just human technology futures. So uh, understanding how, for instance, the questions we ask in data science shape the answers that we give, giving them experience with basic data tools and approaches, such as Jupyter Notebooks, data visualizations, that then they can serve their purposes of understanding, critiquing, and acting, changing the world. And the kind the projects that the students had were oriented, there was a final project, and, and the main that was the main activity of the whole semester, where it's leading up to that final course project. And that profoundly have uh, required them grappling with, you know, how can they intervene? And what does an intervention into justice with data tools look like? What are the limits and opportunities of that? So I'll stop because okay. I've already taken a lot. Um, thank you. Thank you, Margo. I want to loop back to the 4AC class for sure. Um, I would just like to ask a couple questions. There's also some questions popping up in the chat that I'll get to as well. Um, uh, Jerry, I want to take it to you and ask you to sort of reflect on, I mean, I understand there's a goal that like, this is a broad class, 
that a lot of people are going to take. It's going to lead people into a minor that could be like across these institutions. Um, and so, you know, this, this, um, this question of like, you run the first class for the first, you know, as a pilot, uh, you shake it out, but like, what's your, like, did you get feedback? Do you think you're going to be able to make it something, you know, I would say it's like this double goal where you're like, okay, we want to have it like a, a compelling curriculum with the social justice angle, but we also want to be this like entry point for people across the four universities to get attracted to this new minor. Yeah, so um, we, we so uh, first th this course is co-developed by faculty from three institutions, uh, uh, Morehouse, Clark, and Spelman, and it was co-taught by faculty at the different institutions, and the students in the class came from the three institutions, though not not uh, uh, uniformly as uniformly distributed as we would like, and yes, we did get feedback from the students. Unfortunately, we presented the course really late. In the um, in the registration cycle, so it was a fairly small group of students. We had ten students. Um, that course is the feedback from those students is informing what we do for the um, uh, in the fall, in terms of actually formalizing it into a regular offering. What we've learned through some of the modules. So this course is a discussion based course. Um, we we present the students with readings. We ask them to reflect upon them, and then we discuss it in class. There is a um, a, a, a project, a semester long project, where we actually task the students with collecting data to answer some question that they come up with. That that's it's a it's a I can talk about that one. That that's it's it's very informative to see how students um, uh, go through that process and and what they learn in, in doing so. Um, there are some things that are that have been really good in the approach that we've taken because it was a COVID semester some of the things it was difficult to really to really evaluate how effective they were so we're going to we're going to try them again um, there are some things that uh occurred in the class that were unplanned and we just sort of went with with the uh, in fact i'll recount one story there that uh margo i think you, you really appreciate this in terms of um, how we could use uh, an introductory course like this to draw students into data science. Um, we had this, this one session in the course where the class meets Tuesdays and Thursdays. And, you know, it's a COVID semester, students are tired. So at the beginning of the, the class, I, I try to get a sense of where the students are, how's everybody feeling and so on and so forth. This particular day, um, the institutions had signaled that they would require vaccination in the fall semester. And one of the students um, expressed her displeasure with that, with that, um, with that decision. Well, as it turns out, the class was evenly divided. About half the students were in favor, and half the students were not in favor. And so this, this fairly heated debate started to emerge about whether or not we should have vaccinations. And uh, well, so you know, I, I let them sort of vent for ten minutes. Uh, ten minutes turned to fifteen. Fifteen turned to twenty. And I was like, I'm just going to give them this time to go through this. To go through this. And then at some point I started to realize that all the conversation was about, well, I feel like we should do it this way. And I believe that we should do it this way. And, and I think that uh, my, my rights are being violated. And it's all I feel, I think I believe. And so I thought, you know, this is a great opportunity for to infuse, to inject some data into this. So towards the end of the class, you know, I stopped the debate and said, all right, so um, everybody's really passionate about this. I wanna have this debate again on Tuesday, the following class. But this time I need you to go and do some research and bring some data to back up your position. I don't want to hear I think, I feel, I believe. I want to see the data shows blah, blah, blah. The, the research from this person shows X, Y, and Z, and so on and so forth. I, and so, okay, so the students took this and then you report back on Sunday so we can have the debate again on Tuesday. Well, the students went and did, they did their research, they pulled down their data. And by Sunday, I could already start seeing some, and, you know, Half the class was for, half the class was against. By Sunday, I could already see in the writing that some people were starting to wobble a little bit. And then by Tuesday, two of the students who were originally against the vaccination had switched positions, right? And right there, I knew that, okay, um, this is an exercise that, that um, Margot executive to the point you were saying, 
these are students who uh, may not, in this particular case, were not data inclined, but all of a sudden, the value and the power of using data, they could see the data for themselves and it forced their argument in a different direction. And so um, that is one example of, of many type, different types of, of conversation where you could see that exposing the students to data, forcing them to confront the data, have, um, uh, allowing them to wrangle the data could formulate and change their opinions and, of, and also arm them and equip them for making arguments based on data, which is one of the core things that we try to do with that core. So, um, so you can see that, you know, uh, if, you, if you expand that example to a class with hundreds of students, there are gonna be some students who then realize, wait a minute, this is actually a really powerful thing, not, not an inconvenience, not another math class that I've got to take. And that's really sort of what we expect to achieve with with that class. So in that one example there, you can kind of sort of see what the objective is. And and so now the thought is, you know, how do how do we capitalize on this and how do we make that, you know, just a regular part of the offering? How do we do more of that? Um, so yes, we we are looking at the the student evaluation. We've got the feedback from the students. Um, we've looked at what works, what doesn't work, and uh, we're going to incorporate all of those into the what what uh, what we do in the fall. Awesome. Thank you, Jerry. That's great. I like the vignette. This goes with it, like your vignette that encapsulates like the learning that you're trying to do. Um, let me swing it over to, to Anna. Um, I guess uh, the way I would swing it to you is like, you know, I see your like ethics class in the iSchool, like you're, you're explaining that position of like where you're teaching from. Um, and do you have a vision or sort of like, you know, how you could see uh, your teaching being like sort of broader based, like, you know, more, more data science or STEM or like a broader set of students sort of getting this, getting this curriculum, getting either drawn into the curriculum by the compellingness or, or sort of by program design, like, how do we get more students to, to take a class like yours? Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, there, there are a few things here. So uh, there's, there's actually another class that I teach that it's not, that's not an ethics course, but uh, the way that I teach from critical and cultural studies, it, it doesn't, you can't avoid sort of socially relevant topics. I, I actually teach a, teach a large undergraduate course called Gender and Information Technology, and uh, it's for non-majors, and it also happens to fulfill a diversity credit for like the school, like the general ed requirements. Um, for, for better, you know, for, for, for better or worse. And that has actually ended up, that has proven a really effective lever because what happens is I actually, I end up with out of 150 students each quarter, probably half or more are computer science students looking to tick off that box. And in the process, this is one of the few sort of uh, courses that meet that requirement that has the word technology in the title. Right, so like, so there's these, these these computer science students that are like, okay, I have to check this box. This course looks like it's going to be about technology. Cool. And of course, we don't talk about gender and technology without talking about histories of eugenics and reproduction. We don't talk about gender and information technology without talking about sort of uh, the the the, the to, to, use, to use Marco's terminology, the, the sort of co-construction of, of of data, information, categories, and gender uh, and, and how people understand their uh, their own gender or other people's uh, uh, sort of uh, gendered uh, expressions or realities. And so so that has actually proven proven to be a really like subtle curricular institution wide lever that I think more students, you know, I, te I, I reach more students on things that I think are relevant to data and technology ethics in that class than I do in my dedicated sort of uh, ethics classes um, uh, for, for, for various reasons. Um, but I think, I think an, one thing I've been, just to kind of shift, tweak the questions slightly, um, because one of the things I've been really interested in this space and it grew out in part of this, this grant and, and doing this work on, on uh, histories of data, uh, computing and engineering ethics, uh, I have been really interested in the, the narratives of resistance 
to these this kind of coursework, right? The the narratives of resistance to to taking these courses, to uh, to supporting or developing these courses, right? There there are often these distinctions that are drawn around, you know, this is about you know. Uh, this is about programming. How do we get this into programming courses, setting up, you know, the, this kind of uh, distinction uh, or, you know, this kind of, you know, critical uh, critical humanities based or social scientific study happens over there. Not what we do over here. It has nothing, you know, to do uh, to do with uh, sort of our, our technical research or, or worse, it gets, you know, positioned as sort of like ideologically driven in a pejorative sense, right? That, that, you know, this is separate. This is, you know, that, that, that is just politics in disguised as knowledge. And what we're doing is like real knowledge over here. And I used to be somebody who was really sort of invested in, in that conversation and getting and, and sort of like, and, 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 and sort of finding common ground and, and, and negotiating and being more diplomatic. And maybe, maybe it's because like now, like I parent a toddler and I, I, my, my like patience <laughs> level has, has plummeted for, for these things outside my home. I don't know. But one thing I find really, really fascinating is the way that those distinctions, we we often sort of by engaging them in good faith, uh, engaging those, those uh, sort of critiques from that issue from computer science or data science um, uh, schools, by engaging them, we often give them, I think, more credence than, than they deserve. And, and I say this, and, and, and I don't mean to be dismissive, but what what I mean here is that that distinction is actually the like the myth making, right? Like that that is the thing that is not particularly grounded in in evidence. Uh, as Jerry so eloquently says, next time come back and bring your evidence, right? And so next time come back and bring your evidence for these distinctions. And and if you look, you know, Margot, you, you cite you cite Du Bois and you know, Du. Du Bois wasn't presenting an alternative knowledge or alternative science. He, he was actually like, he was like, no, this is how we do true knowledge. And this is the way that your, your, your methods and your approach are tainted by racism, right? Like he, he was actually quite, he was actually a, a, a proponent of, of value neutrality in science, that scientists should aim to be value neutral. And he was just being honest that like, you think you're being value neutral and you're being hell racist. Like that's, that's, full stop. He was actually quite invested in this kind of vision, uh, this, this kind of vision of a value free science, um, for, for better or worse. And you, know, you could look at you can you can look at the history of sort of, you, I think about the the sort of paradigmatic, uh, like the, the paradigm of, of kind of uh, technocratic quantitative knowledge in, in like the, the, the say the, the logical positivists, you know, that that uh, they were communists, right? Like, the, like, there's <laughs> Like th in, in, to say that like this like quantitative knowing gets us that real truth that's separate from politics etc is to like is to completely bracket the the reality of the history of these things and that's the myth making and and I think uh, increasingly my teaching has been oriented towards sort of starting from those not as the kind of uh, like not as like oh we need we need alternative perspectives we need it. but starting from that it was like no, we, we should ground our discussions of data, technology, and justice in evidence. <laughs> and if you look at the evidence, these things have never been separate. Um, and, and so I, I think that that, and that shift you know, is something students, I, I think, really respond to because they're often hearing, whether it's from certain faculty members or, or certain, um, uh, certain podcasts or certain, certain commentators that like, all this quote unquote identity politics politic stuff is distracting us from real knowledge. You know, they're, they're really confused, right? They're really like, they, they, they feel that some things are important, but they're hearing this. You can say, no, we're going to ground this in evidence. And the evidence actually kind of points us in this direction and let's go there. Um, and, and I see a question also in the comments around this too, about like, how do you engage, you know, these, these topics when you have, say, politically conservative um, in, in, the, in the contemporary sort of American sense of politically conservative students. Um, and this is something I confront in, in Washington, even though you know, we're, we're in Seattle, you know, we serve the broader Washington state and a lot of students from Eastern Washington come in steeped in, in, in these, kinds of, um, these, these kinds of politics. 
And I think that my first move and my answer to that question would be to, to, to make this move, right? To, to ground this in evidence. And, and, and strategically first, one of the things I do is I kind of like disavow like the, the popular divisions between conservative and, 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 and liberal, et cetera, and say, those exist, those matter, they shape you know, the, the media you consume, the, the, they, they shape the conversations you hear, but we can also you know, sort of loosely tie them to longer traditions of like political conservatism and political liberalism. And, and then we can add some other boxes to that, right? And start to orient ourselves in these debates. And then it diffuses. So when you, when, when you present something that maybe challenges a, a politically conservative viewpoint, it's not being presented as like, I am challenging your knowledge and your particular experience of watching a particular news channel. Instead, I'm saying like, this is a good faith representation of you know, the, a conservative take on this issue. And here's how it might be limited, right? And then it, then it becomes depersonalized in, in a way that I think is, is useful for students to navigate um, in, in that sort of exact moment. Um, but it all comes from this like, we're gonna, we're gonna ground this in the evidence and, and the evidence doesn't tell us that these things are separate or distinct. Um, the evidence tells us that they've always been uh, entangled. If, if possible, I'd love to just uh, give another prompt here um, that I think the Jerry and Anna have just touched on and maybe I'll swing it to Margo and say, um, what about bringing like the technological side into your like data justice, data ethics class? Like Margo, you did try out having like the Jupyter Notebook modules in your class. Um, and Jerry, if you could, after that, maybe talk about like, what did you bring in for, for like actual working with data into your class as well? Thank you, Eric. I've been really interested in this conversation that unfolded through Jerry's comments and then through Anna's. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the question around the, how we teach the data piece as part of these courses is really part of their response. Um, Jerry, I was I was interested in the way in which you had almost like two days, you know, the first day of like, this is what I feel, the students were saying, this is what I feel. And the second day was like, let's look at the data. I think that the, the, the kind of the, my goal has been um, in the courses to really to to like bring those two together, you know, to not uh, to to count that I feel as valuable as the, this is what the data shows, because precisely of the kind of uh, distinction that Anna Lauren Hoffman's saying, kind of the pervasive way that distinction that separates, this is all questions of ethics here, and this is all questions of facts here. No, you know, the way in which that data is presented, the way that the colors used in that visualization, where those, you know, data points come from, that's all informing our feelings about the situation. Our feelings about the situation matter. And, and so um, I've been struggling in the class in part through the modules that we, the technical exercises um, that we've done and the way that they sit in the context of the class to continuously hold that tension uh, between feelings and, 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 and data to question and use both to question each other uh, because and, uh, you know, so, for example, in this in this case that you mentioned of students grappling with the question of vaccination and return to campus, I think where I would have taken it is to to look at what are the visions of the of the student and of the university in a mode in which the university requires vaccination. I would ask them about what are conceptions of the human subject, the biomedical subject or the, you know, the citizen with rights um, is being kind of in, in instantiated in those moves. Uh, and 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 what and then what's being what are the trade offs you know why are we in a time of covid uh, forced to to abandon broader conceptions of um, you know individual uh, freedoms and and adhere to a biomedical conception of the human that that has certain values and utilities and has certain consequences in terms of life and life and death but i don't think it should be taken for granted that those questions are not on the table and that's a way to bring students of diversity of perspectives across the political spectrum on board in thinking about the ways these decisions actually play out so maybe 
drawing, uh, thinking not what is the right decision for a university to vaccinate, to require or not require vaccinations, but in what forms will the institution implement that decision? So drawing attention to that nitty gritty in which these questions and decisions actually come to matter. You know, will it be through a clear app? Will it be through on your honor? Will it be asked of you to show your, uh, you know, your past and every entrance to every classroom? Those are the nuances that I think students can begin to uh, used to to understand both how the I feel and how the data kind of come together and matter. And so in the modules that we teach with, um, it, we had six, six different data science modules uh, in the course that asked them to grapple with the power of data, both in the kind of the power that data gives us to see and visualize and observe and understand injustice or, or just what's going on in the world, and to grapple with its power in shaping our visions in certain ways that, that then bracket out important dimensions of the conversation. And that, uh, you know, actually as a society maybe don't lead therefore to, towards the, 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 the kind of the justice outcomes that we hold. So we've been kind of, the, the, it's been hard to do that. I think a lot of that work happens in the module itself and the way that it's written. There's a lot of contextualization in the module around, why are we doing this data operation? Where does the data come from? You know, well, what's the difference between this data set and that data set? What are the categories in each data set? So a lot of like unpacking of the context. And it's also about the relationship of that work in that module with the overall framings and context that the courses and lectures and discussion sections provide. So. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jerry, could you touch on the, how you bring the data into your class? Sure. Um, um, so this course, so we started with, with creating a course that was modeled after data eight. Uh, and then we quickly realized that our students, uh, really needed something that, that, that precedes that they, they needed an on-ramp and that's sort of what this, this course is. Uh, and so in terms of what we do in that course is we have a semester long project that I mentioned before, and it's all about asking a question and then attempting to answer it with data. So in this particular case, um, it's a, it's a multi-step process where we first, we, we, we ask the students to pick an area of interest to you within the African-American community, some, some area of interest, and then find a research question. And we keep it vague because our thought on this was if you try and educate a, a, a student upfront about how to properly collect data and do, and do a study, um, that that's a non-starter it just it, their, their eyes glaze over it's like hey, this is a math class so we give them very few guidelines and we just sort of let them discover for themselves uh, and, and so the, and the process is really interesting so we ask okay go come up with a, a research question uh, we ask them that you got to collect 50 data points to try and answer that question and they come up with these questions that um, we want to figure out what what are, uh, I wish I had a couple of the questions up, but I mean it's it's things that would require ten years and and you know hundred thousand data points type of things to 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 um, answer. So I mean, that's sort of expected. Uh, and then we the next challenge is, and I let them I let them stay with their question. Uh, and then the next challenge is um, come up with proxies for measuring some of the things that that you want. You know how happy a person is. Um, directly, so you got to come up with some sort of proxy to, to measure that. So then we challenge them to come up with what are the proxies? You know, we give them the example that you know, if you can't measure the pollen count, you can measure how many sneezes you hear per minute, right? And you can use that as a proxy for, for pollen count. All right. So then, as they start thinking about this, then they we allow them to reformulate the research question, and so the research question starts to shrink and starts to become something that's a little bit more reasonable. All right. So. Once they got the proxy in, in, in place, then we ask them to identify uh, the target group. Where are you going to get this data from? You, and, and the modality, how are you going to collect it? Are you going to um, stand in front of a store and, and collect data? Or are you going to do an online survey? You're going to do interview and so on. And as they think through these things, um, then they reformulate their questions and then the question starts to shrink and becomes a little more manageable. Um, and then they're asked to actually submit a proposal, right? This is this is what I'm gonna this is what I'm going to measure. This is how I'm gonna measure. It, how I'm gonna look at the data, um, and, and then of course we check for that for for make sure that the, the questions don't violate privacy issues. That there's it's feasible. That they've got a reasonable data management plan. Uh, uh, parallel to that, we also teach them Excel spreadsheets. Uh, so we decided to make this Excel based, and so then 
they go out and then they actually collect their data. They then, they then enter that data into the spreadsheet and then they do whatever analysis they need to get the answer, right? So this is where they, they, they do some of the data analytics. Um, we ask them to draw graphs and there's a couple of requirements, things that they have to do. I'm, 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 this part of the, the, the course is a little bit problematic because the students who, who, are, who have uh, excelled um, spreadsheet knowledge upfront say that they're not getting a lot of, uh, out of it. And the students who have no spreadsheet experience say they're having a hard time with it. So this, this part needs some work. But nonetheless, once they've got their spreadsheet, they got the analysis, they draw conclusions, they sort of write it up. Many, uh, a lot of the conclusions is you, we don't have enough data or the question was too broad, which is perfectly fine. And then they report their findings in class. And part of that report is, you know, what are some things you would do differently in, in doing this study? And surely enough, all of the things that we didn't t tell them up front, they've discovered by themselves in the process in terms of how much data you really need, what types of questions should you ask? You ask qualitative or quantitative questions. You can graph the, the um, uh, you can, if, you, if you do a, 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 a Likert scale, right, it's a lot easier to graph that than free floating questions. So they've, they learn a, a lot in, in terms of the process and then they get to do some data analysis and they do all that without feeling like they took a math course. Uh, and, and the feedback from the students on that is that the, the exercise was very helpful. It gave them a sense about how data is connected to the real world. So by the way, we're targeting first and second years. So, uh, and so that, that's, that's how we bring data in the conversation. The topics that they pick are topics that we make sure are, are couched in the, the greater theme of social justice and the African-American diaspora, even though we don't, we don't, we don't uh, uh, restrict them to that, but we sort of suggest that that's where it should go. Um, nice. Thank you. Um, if possible, I would like to move to move on um, to a question that I have personally, um, and I'll go to to Anna. Um, I guess when I think about making some of this new curriculum, I'm interested in the like like resistance versus critique part. Or for me, it's like how do I make curriculum that's not just discouraging, right? That's not just like there's systemic racism and we can show it through data and we can measure, you know, um, and map and, um, you know, uh, expose environmental justice issues through like getting, you know, uh, global data sets. And what's a way to like, uh, you know, a as an instructor sort of put this into the curriculum, but still leave, you know, hope and engagement for the students of like, you know, you're motivated to study this, not just, um, you know, to, to document injustice, but to like provide, you know, tools to the students to like be engaged on on a path towards like creating a more just world. Yeah, it's a great question that I'm not always particularly well suited to answer because I think one thing that we struggle with in this space is is recognizing you, you, you use the word sort of hope and optimism. Uh, we often have a difficult time embracing pessimism as like a legitimate sort of political <laughs> stance and like pessimism doesn't e equal cynicism, right? Like pessimism doesn't have to equal cynicism and, and it doesn't have, also doesn't have to, you know, equal, you know, throwing your hands up in the air, right? Um, and, and so I, I, I think that part of, part of where I, I increasingly come from is from like, how do we like, how do we embrace pessimism and, and, and sort of move forward uh, uh, from there and do things from there and from that place. Um, but I think for me, uh, and I'll be really excited to hear from, from other folks, but for me, the, it is this, uh, the kind of historicizing work that, that you know, Margot has talked about, um, that the, the context that, that, that Jerry's putting students in, that, that, I try to, that I try to bring is that there is there is a sense of uh, it, if you throw people into these questions and these issues as if they are like new and we need to solve them all at once well how how on earth like is anyone like how is anyone going to feel any kind of possibility whether they're optimistic or pessimistic like how is anyone going to feel any kind of possibility 
And so that historical work, I think, allows for that space to think uh, in longer arcs of change, to think in longer arcs of um, of movement, and and that kind of takes some of the um, it doesn't take the urgency away, but it takes some of the intimidation away. Um, uh, the kind of intimidation that might might sort of um, diffuse and discourage action as opposed to others. Um, I think the biggest thing, and I, and I, uh, I draw this from um, the sort of, um, Black and post-colonial theorist, Lewis Gordon, um, who, who talks about sort of uh, liberal modes of ethics as often wanting risk-free action. And I think what students are often looking for and what people are often looking for when they ask ethics questions, they're like, tell me what to do because I want to do this right. Tell me what to do because I don't, I, I don't want to get this wrong. Tell me what to do, this to do because I don't want to get yelled at, right? Like they, they, what you want, what you're asking me for is risk-free action. And I'm not going to give you that. Uh, and, and, and that's antithetical to the pursuit of justice, right? Justice involves doing things in the world. It involves failing. It involves, uh, it, it, it involves, um, being it, it it involves sort of putting yourself into like the crucible of history and time so there's no there's no such thing as as an ethics or a justice that's risk free um and 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 i i find that students are are often quite responsive to that um, nice thank you to pick up on that question too um we were really acutely kind of concerned with that issue especially because Frequently, as people kind of in, in social sciences or ethics, we are uh, kind of cast into the role of critique. And as Anna is saying, I think we're all trying to move a project of better human technology futures forward that begins with education. Uh, so it's not it, critique is part of part of that pro process, but not to criticize the way things are, but to provide ways forward. So kind of that I'm always trying to think of how, how to uh, make the things that uh, I care about, which tend to be too abstract <laughs> sometimes, how to make them meaningful for students in their day-to-day -day work, in the work that they do at, at, at the university, as well as how they will work outside in the real world, uh, in, in corporations, in public policy, in uh, nonprofits that work with data. So to uh, try this out this semester, we. First of all, we had a core project, uh, which was all about, it was called creating tools or narratives of justice. So it was supposed to advance a broader cause of justice through a specific, um, you know, either description, data analysis that created some visualizations and contextualized that and addressed that to a specific audience, or uh, the development of a, of a, a of a computational tool, interactive tool that others could engage with, like a Jupyter notebook, or even one, uh, one group made an actual platform that people could, stud other students could kind of uh, look at um, course distribute grades around in courses. Um, anyway, so tools and narratives of justice. And in the part in, we scaffolded that project throughout the semester. So we had, we started with reflection exercises that write written reflection exercises that asked them to think about what kind of what projects uh, audiences, communities, kind of they they identify with matter to them, um, and we kind of teaming exercises in reducing participatory action research frameworks for ways in which to engage with community members in the in, in technological projects or in other forms of research projects, so that those relationships are also just rather than exploitative. And then one component of this uh, scaffolding was, and I want to share with you. Um, a creation of a, with students work, with students together, creating a rubric, again, and of having them create the rubric for their own evaluation in the end, uh, of course, with our suggestions and our editing. And the rubric emerged out of our reading of works like, you know, Ruha Benjamin, for instance, uh, or of our engagement existing data and justice initiatives like the anti-eviction mapping project, for example, and seeing what are the core, uh, as this first category here says, elements of justice and writing these out. So like surveillance is a common one that, that projects of, that aspire to be just with data need to offer ways for the public to keep the powers that be corporations or governments accountable um, or democratization of data. 
the way in which data is made public uh, or makes it easier for publics to know, to contest, to understand the data. Um, another one is providing ways for public accountability and democratic oversight, making it possible for members of public to hold responsible entities to account for their actions, fostering solidarity and interdependence. So can not just uh, creating a tool that can be, or you know, a, a story that just exists there, but actually engages and supports real human connections and builds uplifting narratives. So um, there were other components of this rubric that had to do with the data and the presentation of the data, but I wanted to show how kind of crowdsourcing through what students were reading, um, through how they were engaging with real world examples of data and justice tools and narratives, we can come up with concrete pretty concrete, uh, you know, beginning at least elements of what should be in a project that tries to do this work. Um, of course, in, in the context of those broader historical understandings. Great. Jerry, I don't know if you want to comment on this round of how to keep people engaged or. I, I think Margo and Anna have covered it well. Nice. Uh, there is one of the most upvoted uh, questions in the chat uh, in the question and answer is, has anyone developed a textbook for this type of course? Um, which to my knowledge, there is not because I see I've read your syllabi and everybody's like, you know, referencing some quite contemporary books and some historical literature. Um, anybody want to comment on? <laughs> where we're at with like a data justice or a data, um, like engaged data science textbook. I think so I a, haven't been able to find such a book. Oh. And, and in particular, I'm looking for one that's, that's even more specialized, right? It's data justice in the context of the African-American experience. Um, I'm not aware that such a book exists. Obviously they're the, um, they're the, um, um, uh, Ruha Benjamin's book. Uh, there are a couple of different books that we source and we, we read excerpts from the different books and use that for conversation in class and for reflection. But I'm not aware of a textbook that, that really covers this in the manner that I envision um, would be the most beneficial for our students. Anna, did you yeah, want to say I think something? I would add to this yeah, this is a good place to sort of flag, you know, the 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 broader uh, sort of the broader contextual challenges uh, of this work in teaching, not only uh, you know not only sort of on our end, but but how that ends up translating for students then is you know for for a lot of us that are engaged in these questions, I, I especially think about you know a lot of the 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 best. Uh, sharpest, most forceful thought in this regard is coming from junior scholars and not a particularly incentivized sort of task if, if for research scholars, for example, scholars at research institutions, especially at the junior level, right? And so uh, I, I think there's a, there is definitely a, yeah, there, there's definitely, you know, a, a need and some forces working against that, against who, who, you know, might be able to take up that project in a good faith way. Um, and then also, you know, I think it is, it also represents some of the, the, the cross-disciplinary challenges in that, you know, a lot of the contexts where we're, we're teaching you know, histories of technology, um, race and technology, um, histories, uh, uh, cultural studies of statistics, of the history of statistics, for example, um, these are contexts where textbooks are like a thing, right? Like, like we we don't you like we don't you use textbooks, right? And and you know, uh, I I on that note, you know, I I think that there's space, you know, there's space in this field for a kind of more targeted and pedagogical edited collection, um, something a little less, uh, something that kind of splits that difference. Because if you try to take, I think what a lot of a lot of us on this call and other folks I know are doing, and put it in a textbook format. Well, you, you're you're already you've already kind of imposed a particular pedagogical logic on like how you can talk about 
say the justice and that and it often runs counter to what a lot of folks are saying and so uh, i think there are there's there's going to be a constant and ongoing negotiation here um and, uh, and 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 at the same time you know thinking differently about the kinds of pedagogical resources we could produce um that's what the difference would also be useful and and, and i'll add to that i think another layer to all of this is that engaging topics that we talk about are contemporary topics, topics currently in the news, right? All of the, the, um, the up, uh, unrest we've had in 2020, the, the COVID uh, pandemic, right? these became really ripe topics, uh, at, at least in, in, in my course. You can't capture that in a textbook, right? Because the very next year, um, you've got a different set of topics that are, that are um, relevant to the student's experience. Um, that was, to me, really key, finding things that, that, that students could engage with. Uh, and, and maybe 2020 and 2021 were just really, really good years for that because those topics came um, fairly naturally. And I think that, that makes a big difference in, in these types of courses. I might add that I fully agree with everything that uh, Jerry and Anna have been saying. And I think there's a real opportunity to really take this invitation of the newness of this kind of, okay, <laughs> now you're, it's not brand new, but in this, in, in this inflection moment <laughs> uh, of the newness of this material, especially in the way, here's what's new, in the way that it's truly being taken up at the heart of core data and computing courses, like in a way that, you know, um, really in a kind of constitutive way, and that's the student's experience of this material is, and that's what they're wanting more of is this uh, kind of fusion. Um, to take that as an invitation to, as Anna's kind of suggesting, invent a new way of sharing, presenting this work. I mean, I'm curious in Jana's question, like what, what is actually wanted by that thing that we call a textbook in the case of this material? Maybe, for example, maybe uh, something like returning like the lecture, you know, like people used to publish their lectures and that was a form that others would take and learn from. And they would study that not as a textbook that's kind of without a voice, but specifically that person's voice and that person's perspective and in the context of their work and where, they're sit, where they sit and their vision. So maybe that's what is needed here is a, a series, a publication of the lectures from these courses that are really grounded in that specific person's position of who's teaching them in their relationship with their specific students in that moment, in that, um, you know, in that institutional context, because that's, I think, what makes each of these really living kinds of courses that answer a need that respond to the moment. So I'm curious what technological or publishing platform would support that uh, kind of thing. <laughs> but I, I think that's what's called for here. And th that would be an exciting project to, to, to work across institutions on. For sure, for sure. I mean, yeah, can I, I, I would. Wanna... <laughs> can I add to that really quickly? I, I, I find that really compelling. I, I often, I think in the sort of like, in the sort of reach for, you know, the, in that sense of newness that, you know, even if it, it is earned it, but it's not new, in that sense of newness and the, the sort of dedication towards innovation, we're, we're, we're often trying to sort of uh, invent some sort of new things and new models. But but actually, Marco, what you've sketched for me is like, that that's so, I often think looking at, uh, at exit models, like that's a, that's a model in philosophy, like, really common of just like publishing lectures or the lectures are speaking to this set of lectures and and you and and you get the you get this really rich dialogue uh th this past year when i taught data ethics during the pandemic suddenly online i was really struggling with how i was going to do this with my undergrads and i ended up i ended up thinking i was like well crap like what did, how do you teach what how do you teach this stuff in the 15th century when you know there's you, you know you're you're all there's pandemic everywhere and you get on the internet or like, you, like what, what are you doing and and i was like oh we're going to just read some books and we're going to read them slowly and carefully and study the texts and and use that as our entry point and and it was a way i could facilitate with like notebooks for reading notes and things online we could have very like structured discussions that i could build based on the reading notes to help with the black hole of zoom right so uh so it it was like it was definitely looking backwards in that sense that that gave me a model for for teaching in this context and um and so i really love that i love that idea of you know 
the, the, the incentives uh, and, and the, the sort of pace of, of production of scholarship and and and, uh, and and sort of various hot takes that people got, you got to get them out. We got to get them out in the hot take economy. And it's just not conducive to that kind of that kind of uh, slower back and forth that I think could be really beneficial. Great. Sorry, Thank you. That was my I'll take my soapbox back. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I think it's an exciting time. Margot's definitely putting a bunch of materials out there. She put an incredible set of materials out yesterday uh, and building out sort of the HCE part of the website. Um, so uh, I, th I think it's a great time to be like sh sort of generating and sharing information um, just because the demand for this, the demand from new people to be able to teach into the space is ginormous. Um, and uh you know it's it's got to be current i think as you're saying like it's it's un, un, unraveling in real time uh but it's also um as i think you've all touched on got to be really compelling to today's students right like um who who have like an active social engagement as part of you know what brings them into the university and college space um, I don't know how you guys want to finish up. There's a few questions in the Q and A that we could lightning hit, or if you if you want to just uh, wrap up yourselves. I think we've touched the textbook question. I think we've touched the what about students who aren't convinced question. Um, uh, somebody asked a specific question. Do you ever feel bounded um, or barriers you feel while dealing with ethics? That was a direct one to you, Anna. Uh, yeah, I actually, I would love to hear hear sort of folks' individual reflections on not uh, so not, not not just my own, but uh, it, the as you as you say, right? The, the demand for instructors coming into this space is is high, and uh, and you know, we often invest a lot of time into thinking about like our you know. The, the experience of our students in this work and 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 how we how we uh, in welcome students into the space how we how we initiate their sort of learning and these concepts um, but then you know all of that bears on 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 us as instructors individually and pedagogically where we're also researching writing and living at the intersections of these these systems right and 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 uh, and and that that's relevant too I think. For me, one of the biggest challenges is this this refrain of you know um, you know that sort of what what you do is criticism and that's over here or I often hear like um, my the, the the really cliched like you, know, you can't you, I was always you know I was always told if you point out a problem you better bring a solution. And I was like, that's a good tagline, but that is like, that is literally not how the history of criticism works. And that is also like, like th that also bars you from pointing out big problems that aren't going to have an evident and obvious solution, right? Like it's, it's, a, it's just a, not a, it's good for diffusing uh, conversations, but it's, it's not actually sound sort of logic uh, for, for engaging broader issues. And I think, I think that that constant sort of, that constant work of having to justify to students and to colleagues, um, while at the same time seeing this demand, right? It, it, it is this psychic disconnect that that, I, that takes a toll. It takes a toll, and I, I think it's played into some of my like maybe more frustrated uh, and and assertive takes. Uh, but I, I think that's one of the places that I've struggled the most. Okay. Uh did anybody else want to comment on that or I think the question is um, do we do we feel bounded um, yeah as, as it's been mentioned that you know th this is an interdisciplinary space um, we're bounded by at least I feel I'm bounded by you know the inability to have expertise in all aspects of this Right, I can't be an expert in 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 uh, theories of just of justice and be an expert in the in the statistics and be an expert in the, uh, the computer science aspect of it. And so, um, you really need 
collaborators to come together and 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 try and and put courses like this together if you're going to do it and and at the highest level that's hard to do that's hard to find that 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 type of the type of individual who, who have disposition the time and, and and everything else required to do that particularly at, at the smaller institutions so that's where i sort of feel that that i'm bounded not by uh, any external force or or or, uh, or administrator or anything like that. But that that's that's just the reality where where we are. Nice, nice perspective. I appreciate that. I might just add that I feel uh, grateful for being where we are because the fact that we have this panel and have just a few examples from real courses that are grappling with this, that's already, you know, that that's already a sign of, of really wonderful work that's at the start of data science as a field, you know, so I imagine next year there will be more, maybe more examples from people who have tried this out. Um, and yeah, so there's a, there's a, a really hopeful good note here too. Nice. Well, maybe that's a good uh, note to wrap up on. I don't know if anybody has final con uh, comments. I see um, people asking for resources and Margot sharing resources in the chat. Um, I would encourage people to check out uh, Anna's web page as well. They're, the syllabus and her classes are there as well. Um, and um, I don't know, Jerry, if you have anything to share or like a syllabus from your class. Um, it's uh, uh, it's a pilot. I'll, I'll dig one up. Yeah, or it'll 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 come around in the future when um, yep. it's been iterated. Um, yeah, I would like to thank everybody for this conversation. It gave me a lot to think about. Um, and uh, that last note of just like we can't all be experts in everything, and we need each other to to collaborate to to create. Um, material that's like appropriate to the space and all the richness and the and the diversity of issues and topics and people and expertise um, that we need to bring together. Um, so thank you. Thank you. It's, it's been my pleasure to be here with this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, it's been you've been at the behind the scenes for a lot of this work, at least at Berkeley and uh, with the modules development and the part of the vision. So really appreciate that longer story and, and today's convening. Great. Well, I mean, yeah, if the you. panelists, you can look through the chat and the Q&A, there's a bunch of uh, nice commentary going on. Nice to meet you all. Could I ask you a question about the, um, I don't know if, if, if we have to leave the session, that's fine too. You don't have to leave. The session's open. Hey, feel free to chat. <laughs> I just wanted to ask, what, what are the next steps for your NSF project? Because that report appears to be like an interim report, even though it's so well polished. <laughs> just, is there more to the project? Are you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, that, a lot of that, the work that went into the report was the stuff that was carved out for UW that we, we were doing there. Uh, and then there's a piece at Berkeley um, and some, I think some of the preliminary work there was presented at AI Ethics and Society where um, Deirdre Mulligan and, and collaborators are, are, are conducting interviews with, um, with industry stakeholders. So folks who have sort of identified, uh, who've been identified as like professing a commitment to sort of ethical and social issues um, in various firms and companies so whether they've carved out specific positions for you know like a, an ethics officer or or, mm -hmm. or or similar managerial position so then thinking about like trying to get like how is that conversation what does that conversation look like yeah. and then the folks at cornell have been collecting syllabi um quite uh, quite extensively um uh, but um, with a more sort of targeted sample approach than than the more crowdsourced uh, approaches to syllabi gathering that have happened in other research. And then the idea is there to do some topic modeling and and get a sense of like what's em what's emergent as the like the sort of canonical issues, mm -hmm. like the early canonical issues in in data ethics and related courses. Um, so that's 
so it's it's trying to come at this three ways like what are people doing in, in academia what are people doing in industry uh and then what is what do they, these histories tell us and how can we then kind of synthesize that um so yeah more work forthcoming for sure that will be so valuable to have like that synoptic view of yeah thank you awesome wow we're looking forward to it. thank you so much for your engagement yeah it's been a long haul especially with covid interrupting the interviews and wow yeah it's been a lot jerry are you going to be teaching next um, next year the course again i am we are offering it again awesome <laughs> and i'm gonna put the syllabus in the chat here oh great thank you all right. Unfortunately, I do have to leave. Yeah. <laughs> but this has been great. Awesome. Thanks Eric, again, thank you for your invitation. In touch. Yeah. Thanks, Jerry. All right. Take Bye. care. And, and best of luck in the coming weeks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.